Good morning. This talk is called uh, Introduction to, to what? To electrodynamics, relativity. I even did not specify whether it is uh, special or general relativity. Probably at the end I will also make a glimpse into general relativity, but <coughs> I will, I will remain on very basic level because my aim is not to train you in uh, manipulating uh, formulae, but rather to understand the structures which are important in physics. And especially I would like to show you how people came to the conclusion that precisely this structure is important and we have to reject the old uh, structures which were so useful. For instance, physics was already a hot subject among ancient Greeks and uh, the, the very name physics comes from the book of Aristotle. Yeah, physics. He wrote also another book, Metaphysics, but the book Physics gathered very intelligent observations. Of course, they are now uh, rejected by us because we were forced to go farther and we realized that this uh, Termino not only terminology, but this, uh, the structures which were used by uh, Aristotle are not sufficiently uh, prepared to discuss phenomena which were above reach of uh, Aristotle. For example, one of the uh, principles of physics at the time of Aristotle and it remained for many, many centuries after was that the, the principal law of gravitation, that the material body who does not feel any force will fall down. And this was at the uh, age of Aristotle, it was very good, very practical uh, low. Nowadays, we know that what is down, it depends upon an observer. Therefore, this law is uh, useful for, for us. But <clears throat> So I would like to show you how we pass from one uh, system of, of uh, structures to the other and so on. By the way, as far as the modern physics is concerned, that modern in a sense that you are doing with your uh, supervisors, I am trying to do modern physics and so on to push, push it forward, I am relatively pessimistic in the following sense that of course during the last century we did an enormous progress but of course, what we do not know is hundreds, hundreds uh, times more than, than what we know. What we know, we just know a very little bit of, about the structure. So the physics is, is, in a, uh, is always in progress. And of course, we have to be trained in the, uh, in the present formalism to manipulate the formulae and so on and so on. But at the same time, it is very useful to think about the progress. And progress will not, according to, to my idea, will not be uh, come from the fact that somebody will add some additional term to the Lagrangian, but rather from changing the system of, of uh, structures which we are using.
The modern science is based on two books, very thin, uh, thick ones, namely Copernicus book and uh, Newton's book. They are very thick and relatively difficult to, to read. I, tr I have read uh, I have read uh, a good part of, of them, but it is a very difficult uh, task to read these books. Why it is so difficult? On the other hand, on the other hand, when I am teaching, when I was teaching students at the university, classical mechanics, what is classical mechanics? It was precisely the story which was invented by Newton to uh, compute the trajectories of planets. Yeah? Okay, so this story, how to compute the trajectories of planets, I was usually doing within a uh, two hour talk with the students. And Newton uh, used one very thick book. And we were able to do this material within two hours' talk. So why? Why there is such a contrast between many years, if you want to read Newton's, uh, not years, say, many days, for instance, to read Newton, and just two hours. Why? Because we, uh, Newton and Copernicus, he didn't know formulae. When we are writing a formulae, a formula, which contains, for instance, an integral or some limit, you know, it is a very complicated story, which, when translated to the uh, simple language, would take a couple of, of pages, a couple, uh, couple of pages. So our modern language of algebraic and differential cal and integral calculus is a, is a new language. And as you remember, before studying physics, we all are uh, forced to study calculus, for instance, which is a language. And only after having mastered this language, we are able to, uh, to study Einstein and his uh, Schrodinger. Uh, by the way, you are coming from which group, excuse me? Computational ah, uh, You are do, uh, doing, uh, done with uh, Professor? Matic. Ah, with Matic. And you? Ah, the same. And you, of course, no. Yeah. So, so, in a sense, we may claim that we are uh, more intelligent than uh, this Newton, because he didn't knew, uh, did not know those formulae. But this is, of course, not true. Uh, Newton was extremely intelligent and probably one of the most intelligent people in the history of humanity. But he didn't possess this, this f formalism. But being so proud of our formalism that we know uh, the calculus and the, the modern algebra, being so proud, we should remember that very often the formalism, the computational formalism, obscures the uh, very sense of the of the story. So. I will start with, with the, the analysis of the substantial 
object, which was in fact the beginning of, of the Aristotle physics, namely the notion of a space. What is space? Ah, everybody knows that this is what I see when I uh, look through the window. So the space is a collection of space points. Yeah? And uh, during many centuries, a space point was considered as a potential place where something may happen. Whether it happens or no, or, or no, it is another story, but it may happen something. When you have the earth under your feet, then it, if I ask you, can you define some space point? Uh, for instance, a definition of a space point is a geological benchmark. Yeah? Where I, in a place where I am living, there is a lot of woods, and I am very often uh, walking through the woods, and I meet geological benchmarks. Yeah? These benchmarks are very important to, uh, to construct the geological chart of the territory and so on. Okay, so you may say, this is my point. I was here. When somebody comes to this, the same place 200 years later, when, when I will be no longer, he may claim that this is precisely the place where Jerzy Kijowski was present 200 years ago. Yeah? But... This is not so simple, because uh, I have read that the Australian continent moves towards you, towards India, with an enormous velocity, 11 centimeters per year. So, if you have a benchmark in Australia and another benchmark in India, so which one shows the, uh, the, the point of, of space? They are equally good. The motion is, from this point of view, is not, uh, is a relative uh, notion. So, for instance, the uh, Aristotle law of dynamics that if a body does not feel any force it uh, remains at rest which is a very intelligent observation everybody knows that if you have a car but no uh, gas inside then the car stands, doesn't move, because the engine doesn't work. No force, no motion. But then there was this, Gal this fellows, Galilei and Newton, who decided, no, 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 no. Motion is a relative notion. Whether you move or not, you cannot decide. Of course, a, if I move, I move with respect to the Earth. So, the same about the distance. We, uh, the, so, can we say that all, those, all this Greek geometry about Euclidean structure of space is wrong? Of course, no. But we must remember that it is merely a mental construction. In some situations, this mental construction helps us to understand physics in some circumstances. But in, it's in some, it is useless. It is useless. So the geometry of the space was codified by Euclid, something around 200 be, before our era, minus 200, yeah? 
And for many, many centuries, this book, Euclid, 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 Euclid's book, how do you say Euclid in, in English? Euclid, yeah? Euclid. In Polish, we use the version which is closer to the Greek version, Euclides, we say. Yeah, Euclid in English. Yeah, yeah so this Euclid construction and his book, which he left us, was considered as, as a very model of scientific thinking. I, and you were probably studied in high school Euclidean geometry, yeah? The, those five axioms and everything which follows from those axioms. This was a model for uh, scientific thinking to such an extent that one of the most intelligent books in philosophy, namely Baruch Spiro Spinoza Ethics, have you ever think about uh, Spinoza, a very great philosopher, Spinoza? So he wrote a fundamental book, uh, uh, of course in Latin, but the uh, English translation would be ethics, ethics. demonstrated in geometrical order. And he tries, tried to mimic the book of Euclid, that first of all he gives five, uh, as far as I remember it was five, maybe more, five axioms, and then, then tries to deduce the entire philosophy like Euclid did uh, with geometry, this this is an extremely important book in philosophy. When I was young, I tried to read this book. I wrote a bit more than a half. This is very difficult uh, book to read, but fantastic. I was really fascinated because he really tries to mimic Euclid books. So we are going to study uh, a little bit Euclidean geometry, but from the modern point of view, because uh, in 19th century, those uh, people like uh, Sylvester, th there was a very uh, strong school of mathematics in England, and they were able to to view this uh, classical geometry from a little bit more 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 modern point of view which is very useful so i'm going to present it later so Conclusion, no space. The, for us physicists, especially those who are doing cosmology, the notion of a space is meaningless. Absolutely. Doesn't mean anything. It has to be replaced by space-time, because an event, it is an event. When I say here, it doesn't here, and I put my benchmark, it doesn't mean anything because with all the with the continents which move, with the earth which moves, with the, our uh, solar system which which moves within our galaxy, which our galaxy which moves with respect to other galaxies, this is absolutely meaningless. But an event, a space-time event, is a good notion. So, let me, excuse me, I took my because 
there is no good chalk here. So, um, take two events in the history of, of humanity. For instance, in Europe, there was a, very often the historians are uh, very fans of battles. Battles are very important. Whenever you take a, a book of history, you find uh, important battles which was, were enumerated. So there was a battle at Salamina where a Greek fleet, very small, very badly equipped, defeated the great uh, ships uh, which uh, belonged to Persian Empire. So it was something around, as far as I remember, minus, minus 480, the Battle of Salamina. And take, we in Poland, for instance, we are extremely proud of the battle at Grunwald. Or maybe I should uh, better cite some important battle of your history, but I don't know very. Um, so there was a battle of grown. So this is Salamina. It happened in Greece. I have been a couple of times there because I was uh, very often sailing over Ionian and. Uh, other seas near to Greece and there was an important battle in Poland which Grunwald so these were two events now if somebody asks you what is the distance between these events uh, so the first the uh, answer is, ah, this, this was some 100 kilometers north of, from Warsaw, and this was in Greek, so the distance would be something like 2,000 kilometers. But of course, if you take into account that everything moved many, many times around Earth, so the Salamina was some, somewhere here, the Grunwald was somewhere here, that you may perfectly imagine a spaceship which was very close to Salamina, and then how many? Around 2,000 years later, he was close to them. So for this observer, the two events happened at the same place. This shows that the notion of a place is useless because it is relative. Yeah, okay. So these are trivial things, but <coughs> so as you probably guess, my goal here is to introduce the structure of the <coughs> space-time, so roughly speaking, for, for uh, Aristotle, by the way, those Greeks were not so stupid, they already knew that the Earth is a ball, they knew that the Sun and the, and the Oh, I forget what is the, the our satellite and the moon. Oh, excuse me. And the both uh, sun and, and the moon uh, are uh, go, uh, their trajectory is around and so on. They knew a lot of uh, a lot of things. Probably there was uh, also a a geo, geocentric school already in Greece, because there are many, uh, this 
the original book which uh, contains this geocentric model is lost. However, there are many, uh, in many places it was mentioned roughly. So probably they were also some Greeks which understood that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Yeah, but this is another story. <coughs> So, so space and time in their in their uh, Greeks um, picture of, of the world were completely disjoint. First of all, of all we, there, were, there was a space. And time was another story. Therefore, when given any event, it was possible for them, first of all, to identify a place where it happens, and of course, identify the time where it happens. So it means that the space-time was something like a Cartesian product. If this is space, if this is time, so space-time was not as nothing especially complicated. It was just a uh, Cartesian product. You know what is Cartesian product, of course, yeah? Okay, but now the Galileo and Newton realized that this is not the case. So what is the difference between this picture, which you may call Aristotle structure of space-time, this is just a Cartesian product, and the Newtonian, or however the name of Galileo should be mentioned here because without Galileo probably Newton would not <laughs> obtain. So where is the difference? The time is remained as a one-dimensional time axis, however, given a, a space-time event, the space was not absolute. We are not allowed to say at which place it happened. Ha happened. Therefore, we may say that in Newtonian picture there is no space, but there is a collection of space at, e at each instant of time. Yeah? Be and a priori there is no relation between if for instance, if I take an event which happened half an hour before, then the uh, question whether it happened at the same uh, space point or no is meaningless. Yeah? Which simply means that in Newtonian picture of time, there is no space, but there is a, an entire collection, infinity of spaces, each sign, so it is something at each instant of time, we have a space. What is a, this space? This is a collection of all events which, are, which happened at the same time. So this we can call a space. Uh, so in, in uh, Newtonian picture of time, space-time is not a Cartesian product, 
but it is a kind of a collection. Now a question. Do you, have you ever uh, studied a mathematical notion of a fiber bundle? This is like a fiber bundle. Time axis is a basis. You, sh surely you know what is a fiber bundle in mathematics. Yeah? So time axis, it does exist. It is an absolute time. And it plays role of the basis. And those spaces are play a role of fibers. Each of these fibers is, has the same structure, one may say. However, there is no absolute identification, like in previous uh, Aristotelian picture. So, yeah? So, so however, because the identification comes with a choice of a reference frame. A reference frame may be considered as such a line, namely a story of an observer. The observer was here and he moves and these are consecutive moments of his life. So this is an observer. And once an observer is chosen, then uh, there is in, in, in this picture an absolute notion of parallelism. And now I'm going to study the structure of this space-time a bit more in details. So what is important, and this is common with the notion of, uh, with the notions which are important in Euclidean geometry, the notion of parallelism. That if I have on this picture a vector, then I may shift it parallelly and may say this is the same vector, however attached at a different point. Okay, so this is the story which is fundamental for, for Euclidean geometry in modern version. Okay, so I believe, oh, oh, we still have a few minutes, so I will begin now this story and I will call it a fine geometry. However, maybe I, I will add more, more comment to, to this picture, because as you see, there are those spaces at a given time. We physicists, we very often say that time is absolute. Time is absolute. But from the point of view, of the practical physics, the absolute time is a nonsense because it is a metaphysical story. Because after all, what is this XT? This is a collection of events which happen at the same time. But we physicists, we never have access to such a collection. When we, uh, uh, when we want to know whether something which happens in Krakow, for instance, 300 kilometers from here, uh, there is probably another uh, course which is given at the University of Krakow. How do we know whether it, is, uh, it happens at the same, same time? Ah, for instance, we found them. They answer us. However, this uh, communication is not uh, travels with some velocity. Therefore, 
the story to synchronize is very difficult story. For instance, when the uh, trains were moving slowly, there was no problem. But already in 19th century in America, it became a very difficult problem to synchronize the, uh, the clocks. Because otherwise, there would be a, ca a catastrophe be between those, those trains. So the, and for instance, to think that we may synchronize the clocks between us and a galaxy which is uh, 10 uh, billion years from us is uh, science fiction. It is absolutely impossible. Yeah? So we should better forget about this synchronization and all discuss it more. But now let me pass to this affine geometry. So this is an Euclidean geometry which is uh, formulated in a modern way. So what is Euclidean geometry? Ah, no, sorry. I will cut it into two pieces. First, only the piece which doesn't allow us to measure distances. And the measuring of distances will be some extra structure. I think that it is very important to understand these notions this way. So, I, okay, so a fine geometry only tells us something about parallelism. So, what is a, a fine space? Oh, space is always a collection of points, yeah? So, space is a collection of points. And, it is equipped with a certain structure. What is important in, uh, in Euclidean geometry? The, the notion of a vector. What is a vector? In Euclidean geometry, vector is nothing but a pair of points. We may, uh, and uh, so if I have a point, let me call it A, a point which I call B, therefore a vector, vector is nothing like A, B. However, the uh, sequence counts because the vector B, A is something different. Very often we use this picture, yeah, that first is denoted with a dot and the second with an arrow. Okay. So, however, what is fundamental in the uh, Euclidean geometry is the parallel transport, which means that we may say this vector and that vector, we identify them. I don't know how you were taught geometry, but for instance, in, in, in Poland, very often they call uh, free vector and attached vector. So such a single arrow, two points, is an attached, is a vector attached at the point A, whereas the, total, the whole collection of this vector and all of them which may be obtained by parallel transport is called free vector. Yeah? So it is an extremely important notion of free vectors. 
and this the collection of so these points so these are points these are free vectors and finally there is a notion of a shift namely a point may be shifted by a vector so this let me use this terminology it is something like plus however i will use the sign plus for addition of vectors and this is something else because this is a shift no? so if i have a point and a vector v so a shifted by a vector v is b you see now if i have another point c and I shift it by the same vector v, so this will be this. Term. Are they parallel? Not very much. Oh, excuse me. Better? Better. Yeah, so this is a point D. Okay, so you understand. So an affine space is a triple. It is a collection of points, a, certain, a collection of vectors, and the action of vectors on points. And now there are some axioms which replace some Euclid axioms which are, so first of all V is a vector space I'm not going to to make a tutorial about what is vector space because I think you have studied it at, at the first year of university so this is a collection of again points you may say point vectors where we have two um, what uh, two. yeah first of all there is a um, two um, action uh, two działania uh, excuse me I've operations two operations addition and multiplication addition is what we know as a, a, we learn in physics a superposition of vectors so this is addition and multiplication is a scaling multiply by three is rescale take the same direction but three times longer and so on multiplication by minus one is inversion what is beginning becomes uh, the end and vice versa and so on and so on so you know and plus uh, some axioms yeah <clears throat> So I have doubt. Uh, so can we? Uh, uh, so can we apply this way? Uh, uh, is it uh, B B plus no no minus minus. <laughs> so yeah, you may say B plus and now minus V. We know what is minus V because these are vectors minus vector yeah is equal a yeah so it also indicate a direction of vectors this thing sorry so i did it also indicates the direction of vectors yeah we do not need to include uh, sub subtracting mm -hmm. yeah we do not need because when we want to subtract we simply add minus vector and this structure 
multiplying by, by minus one is already contained in the notion of, of the vector space. So this, I could introduce such a story, but it is not necessary because it is already covered by what we, what we have. Okay? So we know what is vector space. This is a regular vector space like we are taught at the course of of algebra, and this notion of a vector space was very revolutionary. It was conceived in the middle of 19th century. Such people like Sylvester, then Clifford, mainly English uh, mathematicians. And finally, this structure and of course, some of axioms, namely, uh, if I take a point, I shift it by, by a vector v, and next I shift everything by a vector, say, w, then it is the same thing like A shifted by the sum of those vectors. The sum of vectors I do not need to explain because these are vectors. So this belongs to the structure of the vector space. Yeah? Which simply means that it is the same like E first because... We know that addition in a vector space is, is um, um, uh, abelian, H how you say, Anna? is uh, commutative, yeah. Therefore, it, I might change the order of V and F, which means that if I, the same like consecutive shift of the same point, but in another, another direction. So this is a rule of a parallel orbit, yeah? If I go from this point, uh, and then like that, and if I go first by this vector, and then by this vector, then I arrived at the same point. This is very important, very important. This is the basis of, but, it is nice to divide all this structure into such pieces that first of all we have vectors and vectors fulfill standard algebraic uh, axiomatics and this additional structure. So we may say also in a modern language it is not necessary, but the modern language is that V is an abelian group, group of transformations which acts on, on uh, this space. Now, yeah, because this is the, the action. You, you could as well say that it is V of A, that V, which is a vector, can be treated as a transformation of the space because every point can be shifted by the same vector and give, it gives us the transformation of the space. So, and this is an abelian group. Abelian because in respect, uh, with respect to the uh, addition, the vector space is an abelian group. Okay. Now, excuse me, that I, I am going to obey very strictly the rules which tell that the, uh, a single lecture should be 45 minutes, then break, 
and another 45 minutes. But this time I have not obeyed this rule, so we have now a possibility either to make a short break or to continue without break. In the future I will, I will make break after 45 minutes, but today what do you prefer? Continue. Going further? Yes. Without break? Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> So this is an affine geometry, and Euclidean geometry is something more, because this is on, only uh, the story about those parallel lines. It includes this fi famous fifth, uh, fifth uh, axiom by Euclid, that when I have a line, what is a line? Line is a collection of points uh, when you take a point and you add and you shift it by a vector and all possible it's all possible yeah the, so it is a collection of those points for any t which is a real number ah just a trivial remark when i say vector space I have to say over which body there might be regular, uh, sorry, uh, real vector space, the, which means that this multiplication, multiplication is by real numbers. There might also be uh, complex. Uh, yeah, I, I will mainly focus on, on real, so I forgot to say. But most of this story goes equally for, sometimes I, I will mention which difference for, uh, between real and complex, but I will mainly focus on, on the real. Okay, so now, what about Ah, because in uh, Euclid axiomatics, circles were very important. So, uh, lines, so line is something very good. Parallel line is if I uh, take a, a different point, but the same, yeah? And this axiom about uh, that uh, if I have a line at a point outside of the line, there is one uh, and only one which is parallel is fulfilled here. It is trivial. So we have already done half a job, but now we must think about if we want to think about circles, we must think about measuring distances. At the moment, no distances are defined here. When I have an affine uh, space, I'm not, I have not, no, no uh, instrument to measure distances. Of course, I may uh, compare uh, uh, intervals which are parallel. parallel. So, uh, to say that this, no, this is twice that, so it is easy, of course, but I cannot compare non-parallel uh, length. Okay, so to include the entire geom uh, Euclidean geometry, the modern mathematics had 
invented the metric structure, and the metric structure must be imposed on this vector space. Okay, so what is the me metric structure? So to have the metrics, to be able to uh, calculate distances in an affine space, it is sufficient to calculate the length of the vector. Yeah, because that if we have two points, we have just uh, a vector, and the distance is, is the length of a vector. Metric structure of the vector space. So this is uh, the best the best way to understand this metric structure is in terms of the scalar product of the scalar product. So what is a scalar product? So this is a mapping which to two vectors assigns a real number. This R stands for the real line. I am using this terminology. Okay, I am just using R1 and it is sufficient to, <laughs> to write. No. So whenever I have two vectors, so th this is something like a black box, black box with two entries. I put a vector into one entry, another into another entry, and an outcome is a number. However, not every such a, a black box can be called a, a scalar pro product. Scalar product. Now, so such a black box which fulfills the following axioms. First of all, it is symmetric that the scalar product of, of two yeah. uh, does not depend upon the uh, their order. The second that it is by linear. What does it mean? That if I fix one entry, it is linear with respect to the other entry. No linear, you understand that if I if I put it twice as big as v, the result will be two times bigger. If I put it here a sum, I obtain a sum of results and so on. So it is sufficient to say it is bilinear. I mean linear in one of them, and because of symmetry, it is bilinear, of course. And uh, Third, very important axiom is that if the square of, if I put the same vector to both entries, this is non-negative. Non-negative and in fact, unfortunately, strictly active for V non equal zero. 
By the way, I'm writing zero here and zero here, but these two zeros are completely different things because this zero is a number zero and this zero is a vector zero. Yeah. But of course, I would. Yeah. Strictly positive, which means that if ju it just happens that it is zero, then we know that the vector was zero. Never zero if the vector was not zero. This is very important because in general relativity, sorry, in, in also in special relativity, the the great, the great mathematician Hermann Minkowski was able to capture all those intuitive ideas by Einstein into a nice mathematical, uh, mathematical construction, which we call pseudo, pseudo Euclidean or something like that, where this is no longer true. But at the moment, let us study just Euclidean story. <laughs> now, just a remark. I have a, because of course you know all this stuff, but uh, I want to list all those axioms because they will be important for me in the further development. And now remarks. First remark, you may say that from the uh, practical point of view, a scalar product is not such a, scalar product is something not very close to the, what is important are le uh, length, is the length. Ah, okay, so we have length. What is length? Is it? But why do we stick to this structure? Ah, because if we are able to measure length, then immediately we are able to recover to recover the uh, this. Uh, scalar product structure because say uh, there is a formula which people call uh, um, polarization formula yeah so because of uh, bilinearity this is a sum of four elements, namely v by v, which we call simply the length, square of the length of v, yeah? v by v is the length, square of the length of the vector. Now, there will be w by w, which is nothing but the length of the vector w, and v times w and w times v, which are is it the same story, which means that it is twice uh, v times w. Now, if we do the same for the uh, v minus the, uh, w, v minus w, then what we obtain is again v times v, which is again the same length of v. Again w by w, two minuses uh, drop out, which is again that. And twice the same story, but with one minus which simply means that if we subtract those two formulae, 
we obtain the so finally we get one fourth because if we subtract we get four I divide one fourth of v plus v and this is just the uh, square root of that so I will write down simply as a length of the sum square square of the length this I will write down uh, sorry not plus but minus minus v minus v again square of the length and there is nothing but the uh, scalar product. Therefore, if I am able, first of all, if I am in the affine space, which means that I am able to add those vectors, subtract and so on, moreover, if I am able to calculate the length, then the, uh, I obtain the candidate for, uh, for, uh, for the scalar product. Therefore, the, this proves, in my opinion, that the, this story, this scalar product, is not so abstract, say. It is really, to know the scalar product is equivalent knowing how to calculate the length of vectors. If you want, provide it, ah, I provide it, something happens. Because you could perfectly think, for instance, now, you are used to uh, Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, if V is a VI EI, where this is a, an uh, orthonormal basis, then you are used to this story that the uh, square of this is nothing but the sum of v i square yeah okay you are used to that or rather this is square root of that yeah you are used to that. And for instance, for, for such a definition, everything perfectly right. But you, suppose somebody tells me, I don't like this way of, uh, of measuring uh, the length of a vector. I would put here, for instance, 7, and I will take the 7s or 3. Uh, why this uh, root? Because I want the length to be uh, to be how you say it? Mm, oh, excuse me, my uh, yes. I forgot how you call this uh, this property. However, I want this v to have such a property that uh, two v has a length twice as big as v. And for this purpose, if I put two here, there will be two to the power seven, and finally I I will get this. If I define v this way then this formula, this formula, of course you may calculate this, you may calculate that, you may subtract, and you may say, ah, this, will, this is going to be my proposal for the scalar product. But this is a nonsense. Why? Because this will not be bilinear. So you may say, do whatever you wish. If you, because there is such a geometry that you, that you first define the length of the vector. This is called Finsler geometry. 
or Banach, in Banach space, for instance, you, you, there is no notion of scalar product. Scalar product is in Hilbert space. But the, in Banach space, no. But you have lengths, therefore you could say, ah, but also in a Banach space, I have a vector product defined this way. No. No, because if you just take any Banach structure and you define this object, it will, it is not, it will not be bilinear. A nonsense. Therefore, you may, may say the Euclidean structure, Euclidean structure is just a definition of the length, but in such a way that, the, the, right, that the, this story, such a combination of lengths, is bilinear. Only when it happens that it is bilinear, you, so you may say, take any Finsler structure, just definition of, of, of lengths. If it happens that such a combination is bilinear with respect to both components, then you say, ah, this means that it is some, not only Finsler, but something much, much more specific, namely Euclidean. And I, I am finishing that, but uh, let me tell just another uh, remark, and I would be happy if you try to make a homework, just a small f homework. I'm not going to, to check whether you did it or not, but just for your satisfaction. Namely, all this story was about real, uh, real uh, vector spaces. But also, especially in, in uh, quantum physics, um, the notion of a complex vector, uh, vector spaces is extremely important. In complex, uh, in complex, instead it turns out why? Because of the because of the experience of many generations of mathematicians, it turns out that this uh, sy the symmetry is a very bad uh, axiom. Instead, we have uh, that V and W and V and W in another direction is not equal, but is a complex conjugate. <laughs> but remaining axioms are true, also in complex, namely that it must be bilinear, but, excuse me, with uh, bilinear with with respect to one of, of them. Here, here, if I, if the story was bilinear with respect to the V, for instance, then immediately it is also bilinear with respect to W. But here, no, <laughs> because if I exchange the, the, the order, the linearity in V will enter with a uh, complex conjugate. Therefore, we, if I say it must be linear with respect to V, then it will be, people say, anti-linear with respect to W, which means that if I multiply W by a complex number, then it will be multiplied by the complex conjugate of this number. Uh, so uh, this complex uh, complex space is the mapping to to the complex. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, of course. In com yeah, yes. Of course, of course. 
It is a complex number. Yeah. So uh, the vector space is complex space. Yes. And also the mapping is to uh, not a real. Uh, it's so not a, to work. Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse. I, uh, yeah. 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 Of course. Instead of R, we have a complex number. This V, v is also from. And V is just a complex vector space. Complex vector space. Of course, points, uh, about points, it is stupid to say whether it is complex, real, or so. Only about vectors. Points are points. But vectors uh, are complex in the following sense that they might be multiplied by complex numbers. Yeah, yeah, of course. So the only difference is that this W and V is not a real vector space, but the complex vector space. And its metric structure uh, is again based on, uh, on such a um, form, which is bilinear in one of them and anti-bilinear. Some mathematicians say it is uh, one and a half linear, oh, sometimes they, they say. However, there is a strong difference in, ter in um, uh, not in terminology actually, but in notation, because mathematicians uh, prefer such a notation that it is linear in the first and anti-linear in the second, whereas Physicists following Dirac, who used those uh, bra and cats, prefer that it is linear in the first and anti-linear in the second. Okay, but uh, I hope that we are sufficiently flexible to. Is there any rule uh, to pick the elements from a complex vector space and uh, map to a uh, real vector space? Is there, is there any rule? No, no, it is, it maps from complex to so complex. Say, yeah, it maps to um, complex to complex and yes. real to real. Yes. Any complex to real can be mapped? Does it make sense? Ah, excuse me. Uh, I, uh, yeah. This, ah, by the way, this is. Uh, this is real. How do you see it? Because if you change the order, then from one side it, nothing happens, it is the same number, but from the other side something happened. Name. So it seems, it proves that whenever you take uh, such a scalar product of a vector with it himself, the result is a real number. But it follows already from these axioms. And so now it is uh, reasonable to say that it is positive, because it is a real number. And again, it must be positive and strictly positive for those vectors and therefore it may be called the length of the vector. And the, the other, however, however, again, there is a, uh, so, so this formula is a, a polarization formula, but real polarization. So your homework would be try to uh, to prove or to show the uh, similar polarization formula in a uh, complex case. Polarization formula, in the, just an, uh, as a help for you, I will tell that here uh, two things are not sufficient. You will have to uh, consider four elements. Be not only V plus V, but also V plus I W. And also here, uh, V uh, minus I W. And 
uh, if we calculate the uh, square of the length of those four vectors now, you may combine them in such a way that at the very end you obtain, yeah, and this will be this polarization formula. Try to get it. it this is very important. This is very important, but not for us because in my talk I will mainly concentrate for uh, on uh, real uh, spaces because in general relativity we rather use, but for instance in quantum physics this polarization formula, in com complex polarization formula is very important. Okay, so, so we know, so what is called Euclidean geometry may, may be logically divided into two coherent structure, uh, structures. The first one is the affine structure, which tells you that you may parallelly shift uh, uh, everything. For instance, if you draw any uh, picture, then each point of this picture may be shifted by the same vector. And this is just a parallel shift. And also, if you have a line, you may shift it parallelly and you obtain the uh, line which is parallel and so on and so on, yeah, like that. This is a line. If you choose any other point, then you obtain a line which is parallel. Why? Because its tangent vector is the same and so on and so on. So, and... <laughs> All, all this stuff is very easy and natural, and I'm sure you have studied it, it during your course in algebra on first year or so, but I believe that it is very important to have a, uh, such a list of structures which are important. So what is Euclidean geometry? It's an affine geometry plus metric structure. And of course, metric structure allows what was so important uh, for Euclid, namely circles. Circles, are, uh, if you take point, a number, and you take all the points which you obtain by a shift of this point with uh, vectors which have a given length, say r for instance, so this is a, a circle of the radius r and so on and so on. So the entire, the entire Euclidean uh, axiomatics have been translated into this which is very <laughs> useful, manageable for calculations. However, there are also non-Euclidean geometries which fulfill all the axioms by Euclid except the last one. Because during many centuries, yeah, you see, you see, there, there were those axioms about uh, points, circles, lines, you know? and the last axiom was this famous one that if you have a line and a point outside of it, there is one and only one line which passes through this through this that point and which is parallel. Here it is trivial. In this, uh, in this axiomatics, uh, we see that it is trivial. You just exchange this point by this the other point, and you open. <coughs> but people were trying because they did not understand that such an obvious, apparently it was obvious for them, uh, that such an obvious property cannot be derived 
derived from previous uh, axioms. So there was a very strong conjecture that those axioms are not independent, that in fact the entire geometry is contained already in first four axioms. And the last one, and uh, <laughs> proof that this is not the case, that namely that the last axiom is important, came where people have discovered the so-called non-Euclidean geometries. And I will also discuss, not now, because now we are approaching to the end of the talk. This is practically the end. Uh, I will, uh, let me only make some, some comments. So, of course, uh, trivial non-Euclidean geometry is a spherical geometry. Spherical geometry, so important for me because uh, I was a sailor, now I'm an old, old man, but I was sailing many times. So if you want to find your position on the, uh, on the ocean, which is not flat, but just the uh, surface of, of, the, of the ball, then the geometry which you use is not the Euclidean geometry but the spherical geometry. And there, of course, those axioms are not fulfilled. First four uh, axioms are fulfilled, but not the last one. Because what are uh, lines, straight lines in spherical geometry? There are big circles, like an equator, or any, by any, if you take any point and any vector, there is one and only one straight line, which is simply the great circle. And now if you have such a line and another point, then, then there is no parallel. Because any straight line which passes through this point intersects that. So there are no parallel lines in this geometry. So this was, a, but on the other hand, there are also geometries, which I'm not going to discuss now, where there are, so no parallel lines in spherical geometry, but many parallel lines, infinitely many, in uh, hyperbolic geometry. So then people realized, that, and so on. At, at a certain time, people uh, treated these <coughs> three examples on a, an, an equal footing, saying, the, ah, why? so this means that Euclidean geometry is nothing especially privileged, because we have those different examples. But then, later on, they realized that in a small scale, everything is Euclidean. The surface of the Earth cannot be described by the Euclidean geometry. But for instance, the uh, Wars, uh, if you have a president of Warsaw who gives the uh, the law to construct uh, buildings and so on, he is not using spherical geometry. He is using just Euclidean geometry and it works perfectly. And it would also work perfectly if the earth, uh, the surface of the earth had been not a sphere but a hyperboloid. Everything which is in small, every geometry in small scale is Euclidean. Therefore, this Euclidean geometry is, in a sense, privileged. Okay, I finish my talk and see you next next uh, week. So next week we start at uh, 4 uh, p.m. sharp and. There will be two talks, each of them 45 minutes and 15 minutes uh, break. Okay? Thank you very much. Bye-bye.